even at my stage, you know, 20 years in, I learned so much by being with people. I don't think you ever stop the learning process. There's always a different case. There's always something that comes across. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. The skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. Alrighty, we are nearing the end of our medical series, and this is another treat for me. I hope it is for you. We're here with Dr. Scott Moseman, who's a board-certified child and adolescent psychiatrist, medical director at Laureate's Eating Disorders Program, and investigator at Laureate's Institute for Brain Research. So the title of this, Your Brain on Diets, is kind of like for those of you in my age group, remembering the ads that would show your brain on drugs and it would show an egg being thrown into a frying pan. So yeah, diets can fry the brain and brains show up in different ways pre-diet and on diet. So working with brains that constantly need to be rewarded that is just the reality of today. The discussion between Dr. Voss and Dr. Mosman about setting weight goals and the hundreds of different definitions of recovery. You know, what is your brain's definition of recovery? And listen in for Dr. Voss and Dr. Mosman's opinions about that. You're going to hear again about trabecular bone scans. And I say again because Dr. Phil Mailer's episodes talked about that as well. And to wrap it up, that Dr. Mosman talks about how he has learned what he has. And he said, be with people. Get a group that meets regularly, journal club, peer case consultation. All of these things are far more important than reading books. So we hope you enjoy this episode. Well, we are here today with Dr. Scott Mosman, and we are extremely excited to get to learn from you today. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Yes, welcome. Sure. Just to get things going, mountains or beach? Beach. You know, I think, I think beach just always reminds me. I have three kiddos, family, vacations, those kinds of things. If I could pick a third, it would be stream fishing somewhere remotely, but yeah, beach and family is always kind of go together. Yeah. Okay. And then breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. I think maybe Dr. Godwin also said breakfast or somebody from Laureate was saying breakfast in a specific spot near you guys was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Brookside by day is good. And (laughs) also for work, Gosh, ever since I've been here, even now as medical director, probably at least three or four mornings a week, I'll do Friday breakfast with the patients or whatever, go out. You know, I think it's hard to treat patients without eating with them. So um, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's nice to go out and see them and in their struggles and do those kinds of things. So I enjoy breakfast with patients. Awesome. Audiobook or paper book? Audiobook. I have, I have pretty good ADHD. And so... <laughs> Audiobooks have been my friend, especially when traveling. And I've gotten into two, like I have two kids that play competitive soccer. And so lots of traveling. And so um, enjoying audiobooks with them in the car has is, is become kind of fun. Yeah. I'm the same way in, in terms of being in the car, traveling, or just running errands. Sometimes listening to audiobooks is so much, so much better for me because you can also rewind if you kind of find yourself, Absolutely. you know, fading away. I'm going to ask if you have a story of a board exam, either funny or scary or anything that you want to share with our listeners, because some of them are really just coming into the world of eating disorders and don't really, you know, have the experience necessarily that you might, but we just want to do this on a human level, anything funny or scary. 
the most funny slash scary thing that will reassure people as I've generally had a pretty good career. Otherwise I interviewed for medical school out of undergrad and I ended, I went to Texas A&M for medical school and there's six med schools in Texas. So I interviewed at all of them. A&M surprisingly at that time was the smallest med school. I went interviewed. I really enjoyed the med school and liked it there. I was tired. I'd had like two interviews. I was traveling around Texas. I was in school in Oklahoma at the time in undergrad and pretty tired. Last interview of the day, the guy asked me, okay, well, I know why you want to go into medicine, but tell me a reason why you don't want to go into medicine. And, you know, you're undergrad, you're 20 years old, you know, you don't really have much experience on what really medicine is. So in the hotel, I'd watched a Nightline special on people doing unnecessary hysterectomies on females just because they got paid more for it. You know, so they'd make recommendations because it was a procedure. And I was like, that's horrible. Like you're supposed to go into medicine to help people. So I spent about 15 minutes describing to this doctor why unnecessary vasectomies were a problem throughout time. And all these unnecessary vasectomies happening to women were such a travesty oh, no. of medicine oh, over time. And he let me go <laughs> on and on and on. And then at the end of my interview, he goes, did you mean hysterectomy? <laughs> and I was like, Absolutely. I did. That. And, and my mother actually picked me up because I was, you know, I was traveling. I didn't, I hadn't driven down. I'd flown down to Texas and she's like, how'd it go? I'm like, I loved it. There's no chance in hell that I am getting into Texas. <laughs> and, and, that and, is and, and I got in, they let me in. Maybe they figured I really needed some anatomy <laughs> left to have things done or the rest of my interview went well enough and um, it worked out. That I sure, think it was a yeah, it was a must have been a very memorable story. Yeah, yeah, they're not going to forget the interview of somebody else. But, um. Oh my gosh! Oh, this is great. Okay, well, how did you get into the field of eating disorders? You know, I have always been drawn to a challenge, right? So I actually, there was two things that happened. I did my fellowship at Western Psych in Pittsburgh, where I worked on the Copes unit with a wonderful doctor. And I enjoyed the work there. I was actually doing bipolar work when I was there, the child lesson bipolar services clinic, another challenging thing. And I think during my chief fellow year, I had thoughts, we were getting ready to have family. We had thoughts of coming back to Tulsa. So, you know, I grew up around Tulsa. I think the eating disorder program was, was always sort of well-known even in the, in the city and, and, and around. And so I looked back to, to, to I interviewed at Laureate and I kind of had told Jeff Mitchell at the time and, and, and Dr. Craig Johnson, Hey, yeah, I can do some eating disorder time up in Pittsburgh. If that would help to do, you know, some, you know, if I could cover some call and I'm trying to get a job, I guess, back home when that happened. And so I worked up at Pittsburgh doing that. And then literally I was just coming down to Tulsa to live by family, to be a child psychiatrist. And two months before I came down, the adolescent doc had quit. So they asked me to do it for, for three months. And, you know, that was 17 and a half years ago. Wow. So, um, and, I, and so I think uniquely drawn to the challenge, the last 10 years, I've got to combine that with working with Dr. Simmons and now Dr. Kulsa at the Brain Institute. So, you know, getting to do outpatient, inpatient, do some research. It's kind of, you know, for somebody with ADHD, it's kind of a, a dream to get to, to mix around things, keep my intellect going, keep things interesting. So it's, it's uh it's been very rewarding. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. And that's what we have a lot of questions for you about the Brain Institute. But uh, one of the things that you are really known for is the neurobiology development of psychopharmacology and eating disorders. And so we want to pick your brain about that. But also, why peds instead of adult? You know, I have always been drawn to, to adolescents. I, you know, the process of adolescent brain development, the process, you know, the process, my wife and I actually met at an Episcopal summer camp working with kids. She still works with adolescents. And, and then truthfully, you know, cause you don't know, I did my adult training in Arizona there, you know, they're so desperate for child psychiatrists. I was like, well, I'll try it. And if it doesn't work out, even if I just treat teenagers, you know, it'll give me more job opportunities. But I think the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. It is challenging. It is challenging with family dynamics, but I also think, you know, it, especially with eating disorders, it's a chance to get in there earlier. I think every study shows, you know, the earlier and harder you hit it, the better chance you have of somebody being able to stay stable enough to develop out of it and have more true recovery over time. So it can be challenging. It's a very difficult illness. They have a brain that's really not ready all the time to, to do things. 
but it's, you know, so rewarding now, you know, doing it for 17 years, I have two previous patients who are doing neurobiology research into eating disorders, you know, doctors, moms, you know, I, I, I still, it's, you know, a field where I can still keep in contact with my patients that are doing well and to see, to see them thriving for all the, all the things they get stuck in as a teenager become wonderful when they're adults makes it very rewarding. Oh my gosh, that comment that you made to, to have a brain that's not really ready because we hear that brains aren't fully developed until, I don't know, 25, 26 or somewhere in there. And, and that's such a, just a kind way of, of saying, you know, you, you're just not ready yet. Your brain isn't ready yet. It's nothing wrong that you're doing. And I know people who were patients of yours, who their families wanted to move to be closer to you. You have that pull on people. And so what you just said about, you know, being in the field long enough to have families and past patients already being colleagues, and that's so rewarding. Yeah. I mean, I always, you know, so certainly I've had you know, lots of dietitians and therapists and those kinds of things come through their career here at Laureate. And I always tell them, you know, you've got to give it five years. And I think at about five years, you make one or two determinations. You determine that like, okay, this was a rewarding, fun chapter of my life, but this is really hard. And I can't not take this home. And I can't, you know, keep my own, <laughs> my own self out of it. And, and I probably don't need to do this anymore or you kind of fall in love with the field and, and really feel like you start to see people after five years who have been well, you know, there's a lot of recidivism in the illness, a lot of struggle in the illness where you can get to four or five years and sort of finally realize, okay, this is something I can do. And, and it's a careful balance. Cause I think you have to have good boundaries. You have to be able to not take things at home and be with your family, but you really have to care, right? Teenagers are really, really good at knowing when somebody really gives a crap or not. And so that ability to relate and to connect to them with good boundaries is, is super important. And so recognizing that you have that is, is, is very important. And I think that's such a good point to make because from the outside, a newer person coming into the field of eating disorders, maybe you don't think about the baggage that can come with this and what you do take home, but it is an important step to consider. And Beth always says, something that has helped her through this and other, at least dietitians and therapists is just the active supervision and having your group to talk to. And I imagine that at Laureate, you guys are such a close knit group that that must help as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would say, even if you're outpatient, unless you're on an Island and we definitely need practitioners that are out on islands of, 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 you know, lack of care, especially earn your career. Group-based practice is so important. Even if you have to just get, a journal group that meets once a week, you know, and I, you generally tend to find trying to do care, even outpatient without knowing and communicating. If you're a therapist with your dietitian and with your doc, or if you're a doc, you know, vice versa, trying to work together. We certainly have the advantage here. You know, we meet for over an hour a day, every day to talk about patients. And, and you have, you know, people with, we have people with 25, 30 years of experience that uh, can speak to things. And so, I'll put a plug in here because it's very important. So when they come and do their SED certification, I think they're surprised when they go to the classes of like, you know, I've only been doing this for, you know, three, four years. How much do I really know? But every day meeting, talking about patients, doing supervision in case management is just hugely more satisfying and, and such a more rapid learning curve that you, than you can read in books. Now, I think reading is important, but if you're outpatient, it's, having a zoom meeting with people and discussing an article doing supervision. You know, I, I think that's a w wonderful thing about SEDS is having supervisors that can help as well. All those things are hugely important. If you try to do eating disorders by yourself, using book management without help, I, I think it's almost impossible. These illnesses are so incredibly complex. And, and it is one of those things where I think unmeaningfully you can do harm, right? In, in trying to, you know, figure out, you know, setting people's weight ranges too low because you want them to feel comfortable, not challenging things because, you know, you want things to work. I mean, having the confidence of running things by people is, is incredibly important in the field and trying to find a group just to keep yourself at bay too is, is incredibly important. 
Huge. Book management is something that you said. I haven't heard it termed that way, but it can be like, okay, I'm going to read this chapter and I'm going to hang my hat and say that I work with eating disorders. And so this is incredible. So keeping, getting people around you, making sure that you're, you're in touch with people, you're running cases, doing journal reviews, et cetera. Welcome, Dr. Voss. I wanted to ask you, Dr. Bozeman, you brought up growth curves and I feel like in the adolescent world, that's you know, teen and adolescents and children, that's one of the biggest struggles is where do they fit on that growth curve? And as you guys on the inpatient and residential side are often the ones seeing them when they're at their absolute sickest and may not even have access to some of those earlier growth records. What do you and your nutritionists kind of do to come up with that weight range? Yeah. And I think that's something, you know, somebody, you know, being in the field for 20 years that I really like the movement of in the last five to 10 years, definitely the last five years, you know, this idea of healthy at any size, this idea of genetics and growth and growth curves is hugely important, you know, trying to follow BMIs, which are made for populations, trying to follow rule of fives or charts that came out in 1969, just, just don't, I don't, does the patients any justice. So I think there, there is a few things that we do. First of all, we will beg, borrow, and steal for any time that we can get a height and a weight and an age at any point, because you can start to at least do some extrapolation from there. I think otherwise, then we try to generally take approximates of like where they were before they got sick. We make a guess, you know, if we have to make a BMI-esque based guess, then we'll look at that. And then I think too, you know, I'll look at DEXA scans, I'll look at hormone health and those kinds of things. You know, I think estradiol levels over a longer period of time can be an indication in at least women. I mean, in men, it can certainly be difficult, more difficult, but in women, sometimes estradiol levels and proper menstruation can be important. And, you know, actually, I think, you know, to take it a layer deeper, you know, with, you know, some of the research that we're seeing now at the Brain Institute, I still deal with the fact that some people who develop anorexia nervosa as they hit puberty or otherwise will still have growth curves that are low even before they get sick, right? You get these people with GI-based anxiety, avoidance, things that even before they develop body image issues or other kinds of things on top of it, they've already developed this sort of association of who likes to eat on a nervous stomach? And if you have a nervous stomach all the time in grade school and you tend to avoid when you get nervous, I I think there's a subset of patients who are chronically sort of relatively underweight before then they hit, you know, puberty or something else happens. And then they get sort of a good case of anorexia on top of some either ARFID type symptoms, sensory-based anxiety symptoms, GI-based symptoms that happen as well. Or if you have patients too that, you know, might be, you know, comfort eating or binge eating on top of things before they get sick. Right. And you don't want to set them too high because now they've just taken the other side of things. So, you know, I think growth curves are nice, but I I still think you gotta, you gotta dig deeper. And then over time, if I can follow somebody, then, you know, we let the dietitians do their job and like, you know, over time you get the calories right for the activity and then their, you know, their bodies will end up where, where it's meant to be if they're really doing that. So, it, a great question. It sounds like it should be easy, but it's, it's, it's not, not and, easy. And, and you've got to individualize it from patient to patient. What do you, you said estradiol and DEXA scans. Are you trending estradiol over time? And are you looking for certain values? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's so, such a wide range. Yeah. And it can be. Yeah. So I, you know, I think what we're looking at, you're looking at the individual. So I always think about, well, you know, the, the endless call, the endless thing of like, what is recovery? Right. And I actually did a presentation with Dr. Kalsa who works here on trying to, you know, the hundred different, different definitions of what that is from lack of pathology to proper function, to your weight being right, to your body working right. So I like to use a simple philosophy is, is things working the way they either did before the eating disorder, if you have enough healthy period before the eating disorder or what you would expect them to be otherwise. So even bone scans, depending on genetics can vary, right? But if I clearly have, you know, trabecular lumbar bone, that's way off from the rest of the skeleton, I know that there's probably an acute change. If I have somebody who doesn't have a genetic history in their family of bone density problems, who's been chronically underweight, 
you know, then hanging some weight on those bones could be helpful. You know, for estradiol, I mean, a normal functioning, reproductively functioning female should be having a regular period, right? So if the nutrition's right and the weight's reasonable, I, I'll give two case examples. It shows how old I am or how long I've been doing this. So I have patients I treated in their teens who are now in their twenties and married and trying to have families. And they really seem to be in a good degree of recovery, right? They have families. They're not thinking about food. They're successful in their jobs and other kinds of things. And they've come to me with reproductive issues. They're actually still having a period, but they've been able to conceive. And so in that stage before they're going to spend $20,000 a pop on in vitro or whatever, they'll come to me and basically say, I'm willing to do anything. I want a baby more than anything. Eating disorders in the rear view. Let's do whatever we can. I've had two patients now where I'm like, let's put seven or 10 pounds on you and see what happens. Like maybe not purposefully anxious stomach, what your insula tells you about fullness on top of your anorexia is just not right. Even though you're making choices, your intuitive ability to understand your stomach and what it needs might not be quite what it needs to be at peak reproductive health to have a baby. Right. And then, you know, let's make sure your stress levels are okay too. And then both of them, I put weight on them, you know, estradiol levels were sort of in the low forties. I got him to the sort of mid to upper forties and and put some body fat on them and put some weight on them. And both of them were able to conceive without needing extra drugs, extra fertility stuff. So, you know, for me, that's a very much functional thing. I mean, that recovery is about, I want to have a period. I want my body to work right. When I want to have a family, I want to be able to have kids, you know? And so trying to look at those function things, it shows the nuance that happens with where your body is, is really meant to be. And when it's working, right. Yeah. And we can add my client to your N of two, I N of three, and it was five pounds for her. And right. it was, it, I love how you said that insula isn't you, it, you know, you're, you're talking through the brain of what the brain is signaling to that person. And maybe the anorexia, the history has clouded them and, and they, they feel like they're eating intuitively and eating and filling up but they just need their bodies physically need a little more weight, a little more fat percentage, whatever it may be. I really love the idea of intuitive eating, right? And I know that's a big topic nowadays. It's a topic that, you know, us at Laureate, even doing inpatient work are trying to look at, you know, there's great FBT data. There's great data to show that you need guidance, but over time, like what does recovery look like? And, 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 and you want recovery to look like people just not thinking about, you know, food and calories and meal plans as much and thinking about their life, friendships, spirituality, whatever's important to them more. But, you know, there is a subset of patients who, you know, insulin and brain don't communicate well with their body. That's the reason why they have somatization and they, you know, have physical symptoms. It's the reason why they experience their emotions in their body through fullness and through stomach issues. And so there is a subset of patients where if they just intuitively listen to their body, their body lies to them, you know, and doesn't tell them the truth. And so sometimes conscious awareness has to come. Dr. Foster, what's, what's your thoughts? What's your thoughts on medically what you're looking at when you sort of know you got recovery or when you need to to move forward? Oh dear. Thanks for that. (laughs) I am very similar to you. And I think I have the ability in the outpatient world to follow them for quite a long time. And so I often tell my families something very similar. Is their body working the way that it should be working? Are they able to eat like they did beforehand and flex their eating, you know, go out with their friends and have pizza and not be stressful about it? And then are they able to do all of the activity that they want to do and still keep their body in a safe place? Because often what I see is that we think we're in the white range or the, the very low end, but then as soon as we add activity, it dips back into that starvation mode. And that's when we say, okay, same scenario as you guys in the adult world with the pregnancy is we're just need to get a little bit more on so your body can stay safe. And what do you like to do with periods? So when you have patients that come out and they're basically in weight range, you think they're where they need to be and they're still not having a period. Sometimes if you send them to the ob they'll just give them a progesterone challenge or throw them on yeah. birth control. What's your, what's your thoughts on what you like? To I like to, I, I, if their DEXA looks okay and they're eating well and they're and their fat percentage as well, their labs are okay. I like to give it some time. I have seen it take six months. I've seen it take up to a year before, but yeah, I will, 
I'll give them about six months. And if they haven't had anything, then I'll do an additional workup to make sure we're not missing anything, get all the hormone labs and stuff. And if, and I'll tanner stage them and make sure they're developing correctly. And if they all look like they're healthy and they're eating appropriately and their DEXA scan is fine, then I give them another six months. I don't know if that's right or not, but (laughs) I've only had a handful that we decided to do an estrogen patch with because it was for whatever reason, they were just kind of in a chronic state and they were hitting 18 and not able, they were athletes and just not able to quite get there. We needed to protect their bones, but I defer to you. You are the master at all of this. (laughs) I'm still new in the field. So you've been, you've been in the field long enough to do it. And I think you do, you know, my outpatient, you know, Tulsa is a little more limited outpatient wise than what I'm able to see. So it's always kind of that you know, you try to do what you can inpatient and residential, and, and it is that long-term follow-up. And, and and I think the difficulty with outpatient is not knowing, you know, inpatient, I'm pretty sure what's going in. I'm pretty sure that they're getting the right types of foods in. I'm weighing them every day. I know they're not water loading. I know, you know, all of those kinds of, of, of impacts, you have so much more control of knowing what's going on for the output and, you know, and, and outpatient, it's so much more, you've got to mm-hmm. kind of trust and and you don't know exactly. I mean, are they really getting in the right? I mean, having the wrong types of food can keep you from having your period, right? Right. Right. And stress. And I just felt I'm a big person with trends. I Mm -hmm. I trend over time. That's my thing. So So both of you have talked about the DEXA scan and Dr. Mosman, you mentioned something about trabecular lumbar change. What, what is like, what does that tell you? So, you know, you know, if you look at what causes bone changes in, that's a young woman with anorexia over time, a long time ago, I think even before I came here, they did a study. That's the only reason why we have great DEXA scans because they bought a fancy scanner to, to do the study where, you know, you look at bone development. And so why do people with anorexia have bone problems? And, you know, at first of all, I think there was a heavy blame on hormones. You look at menopausal age women, it's the change in hormones that tend to cause osteoporosis and issues. And so I think there was a lot of emphasis on these, you know, young women with anorexia, not having estrogen, that this was causing problems. And it turns out that estrogen probably is more of a minor impact to them. And it's probably really the weight that they're hanging on their bones. I mean, I always say to families, you know, your, your bones don't, and genetics don't know any better. They think your daughter's been in space with less gravity hanging on them over time. And what happens is the trabecular bone in the lumbar spine. So whenever you get a DEXA scan, you usually get total body skeleton, you get lumbar spine, and then you'll tend to get some femur because there's some parathyroid issues that sometimes impact different areas of the skeleton differently um, when you're getting a DEXA scan. And so for me, that trabecular bone, that lower lumbar spine bone, it tends to change and react more quickly to loss of weight. And so if you see large differences between trabecular bone and the rest of the skeleton, you know that there's probably been an impact on this skeleton from lack of weight that's there. And so I always say, number one thing is to get weight back. And then estrogen levels can be helpful over time. As we're talking development, the other important thing is if you get somebody that gets sick early enough, remember all these DEXA scans are done with a Z score, which for you know those in statistics is you know you got to compare to other a 13 year old to other 13 year olds and if you take somebody who because of their weight and hormone status has kept themselves sort of younger right you're not necessarily comparing to apples to apples so sometimes bone scans will look worse just because you're comparing with other 13 year olds who you know nowadays i mean we look with we can talk about hormones and bottles and everywhere else like the age of a, a average young woman having a period has gone down by two years, I think in the last 30 years. So you're comparing girls who are really post pubertal by two years, which girls will to delay their period. And so sometimes their bone scans will look worse and then they can catch up over time. You get estrogen back, you get weight back. And so that's the reason why serial DEXA scans are important, right? Comparing them against themselves is probably more important than comparing them against their peers. And sometimes if their scans look bad, but they're 13 and they've really been sick. I mean, there's some good studies which show how fast you can get that bone back. And it's really pretty slow, even if they do well, but if all of a sudden they're catching up developmentally, their peers, sometimes developmentally that, that, you know, they can catch up a little more quickly once you get sort of hormones and proper development in play. Because this is sponsored by Laureate, I just wanted you to know how thankful I am when this 
podcast can be sponsored. It is bringing information to those of us as professionals in short bites in ways that hopefully you are enjoying. Laureate is an intentionally small not-for-profit eating disorders program. It's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they provide exceptional care, I know that, for women and girls since 1989. Laureate's individualized care and nature-focused campus and relational philosophy, along with dedication to eating disorders research, as you listening to in this episode and Dr. Godwin's episode, set it apart in the national treatment landscape. The program consists of independent adolescent and adult programs. So know that patients benefit from a one to three therapist to patient ratio, full-time board certified attending psychiatrists, evidence-based medical nutrition therapy, and dedication to continuity of care. Many of their staff are certified eating disorder specialists. It's not an easy task to get that certification. Patients are treated by the same physician, therapist, and dietitian from the acute level of care all the way through discharge. So adults, patients who successfully complete the inpatient program are offered 30 days of care at Magnolia House, which is Laureate's independent living home at no cost. So you can learn more about the life-changing happenings at Laureate at stfrancis.com slash Laureate. I want to go back towards more of the psychiatry stuff for a second. So what, since you've been in the field for a while now, what trends are you seeing in kiddos coming in with anxiety? You mentioned earlier that sometimes they're coming in underlined with that. And then as puberty sets in, that's when the eating disorder comes along. So what are the trends in anxiety? Do you feel like it's coming on earlier and are things that are making kids anxious changing as well? Uh, it's an excellent question. So I, I really underlie and have a, the paradigm of which I look at eating disorders is that they are stress and anxiety disorders, right? I, I feel the same thing about post-traumatic stress disorder, OCD, depression. So I, I really like to look at brain stress resiliency more than put things in boxes of, do I have this and that, and what medicine uh, ramps up. So therefore I look at medicines not as antidepressants or anti-anxiety agents, but they're trying to make the brain more resilient to stress. So there's a few different things. I really feel nowadays with kids, influence of the pressure that we put on kids early before their brains are ready. And then the influence of social media screens, et cetera, has become with it. If you happen to throw in a third thing, which is throw a pandemic in for the last two years, things have been I, I, 20 years. I have never been as busy as I've been over the last two years, both inpatient and outpatient. So all those things, again, if you look at it from the concept of stress, again, we tell kids wear your bike helmet, come in on time. We're going to track you every second of the day. Like life's not safe. At the same time, we tell them, you know, you should be a, you know, should be a competitive ball player and make straight A's and do five extracurricular activities and take AP classes and get into the right college it really, I think it really messes with brains to have both of those messages, which is you're relatively unprepared for life and life is dangerous, but let's do all these things at such a high level in comparison. And then you throw in social media, which I really think is rewiring brains and how they look and compare how things work. It really sets up things for, I think, anxiety to be much more pronounced. And we're seeing it much earlier you know, with young women, if you get hormones coming earlier, I think hormones, estrogen exposure really affect female brains earlier. So I really think, you know, we're seeing a lot more. And so then you throw a pandemic in, which throws a major amount of stress and it becomes the fuse on the bomb for, for things to go off. And my hope would be politically, we can get off our soapboxes and really take care of mental health, we can really understand the importance of balance of new studies on how social media is affecting kids because again, uh, no shortage of work. Any, yeah. any, as with anybody who's working with adolescents at this point. Yeah. I have to say, I mean, I have a question about how you think that social media is rewiring brains and, and the political piece of it. I, I have to believe that things like Kerbo or some of the programs that were designed for kids to help them, an app to help them lose weight. These are, the Academy of Pediatrics has said, 
in 2016 said, don't talk to the kids, don't put them on diets, right. um, especially self-help diets. Uh, I mean, when, when I say Kerbo, I'm talking about programs that have coaches, so it's not sure. fully self-help, but it's, it's not a personal relationship. So how do you think social media is rewiring brains? Well, so I think there's two different ways, right? So you're, you know, you're talking about specific influences that media and electronics are having on how we look at diet culture and how we look at dieting. And then I think there's a greater thing, which is in developing brains, how are we, you know, rewiring the way in which they pay attention and the way that they, you know, what they expect dopamine cycles and reward cycles and brains, you know, I'm speaking to the choir here, but dieting is dumb. Dieting doesn't work. 95% failure rate at five years. You know, there is an obesity epidemic. We do have far too many simple carbs. Again, rewiring of the brain millions of years. We don't have simple carbs available at our fingertips every second. Uh, obesity is a real issue, but I, I, you know, I think us and eating disorders sometimes get missed out of it's possible to do too little and that, you know, dieting really doesn't work. So why influence kids at an early age to be counting their steps I, I do have three kids at home. I have a 17, 14 and 11 year old at home, you know, at my son's high school, private Episcopal high school, you know, I've been consulted because, you know, there's all these apps now that count calories and people are comparing and sharing results over social media and doing those kinds of things. So that from a standpoint of, you know, comparison, body image, bodies aren't real filters, all those kinds of things are hard. And I think you throw on top of that, you know, we're training brains just to have to be always entertained and instantly rewarded, right? That dopamine cycle over time, I'll speak as a parent of a teenager now, two teenagers now, one boy, one girl, like, you know, my punishment stuff is, is revolves around getting them off screens, right? If, if they had to choose between having their car taken away or taken off screens, they choose the car every time. And, and from my generation, car was freedom, car was everything. Now it's like, well, maybe I'll get my license when I'm 17. I've instant access to all my friends anyway. And doing those kinds of things, it really is reshaping brains and reshaping how we think about things. And I don't think all social media is bad, right? I have a socially anxious son who is on Discord and has friends that he can talk about. He does Dungeons and Dragons online. You know, the nerddom has, has, has worked its way down generations, but it, it can be helpful with positive things. But, you know, where's the filter? You know, I, I am still not one of those parents that says, okay, well, nothing at all until, you know, they're 17 or 18. Then you send them off to college, you, you know, and then they're barraged with it and a brain that hasn't even learned to do it. So, I, you know, that's the wild world. Never mind getting into TikTok trends. I have kids coming in with artificial tics, you know, gender issues and those kinds of things, which are already complicated for teenagers as well and have huge both eating disorders impacts. And now, you know, I have 11 and 12 year olds who are not sexual beings who are choosing a compendium of 50 different choices of sexuality, gender, other kinds of things. It, it I think it makes things incredibly complex and it, it ends up being very stressful for developing young adults. And I was going to say, kind of in part to what you're saying earlier about kids constantly being in five extra curriculars and all these other things. It's that like constant stimulation. It starts with maybe the social media and then now they're in these extra things and it's like they just don't have time for their brains to rest. And what I find in a lot of my EDs is that they don't, they don't want to be alone in their brain. That's when those scary thoughts and all of the, the kind of deep stuff comes up. Yeah, I think we've lost play. We've lost downtime. You know, even in programming for our residential patients, I mean, we have stuff on the weekend. I mean, I got to get my therapist a break at some point, but like we have stuff on the weekends. We, you know, they have outings, they do stuff, but we program in downtime to see how that works and see how that goes, especially for I think people with eating disorders, that anxiety thing of avoidance. If I'm working, if I'm doing school, I don't have to do things. And a larger cultural issue you know, inventiveness happens when we're bored, you know, they, they just, kids aren't just allowed to be bored anymore. They're not allowed to, you know, and I think it affects inventiveness, creativity. And so in some ways, extra activities can be nice if it's reasonable. Playing a sport, doing, you know, I've, I've made the rules for all my kids is you need to do one 
movement thing and one artistic thing. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're good at it. You know, if you get competitive and want to be good at it in order to have some balance, but for, again, for anorexic patients, them being in five AP classes and three extracurricular activities and doing all these things over time that stresses them out. Again, I think balance is, can be a key. The training the brains that constantly need to be rewarded. I wrote that down because that is, that is that brain impact that you're talking about. And I also highlighted the dopamine cycles and that, you know, bodies aren't real. So those are, those are true brain changes that have to be addressed for someone to move past their eating disorder. Can I speak in really fast? Because you guys have mentioned the word insula multiple times Mm. now. Thank you. And I'm thinking some people might be thinking you're misspoking saying, no, the word's insulin. (laughs) I'm wondering with Beth's comment, if you can, before you dive into that, take a step back and talk about why you're talking about the insula, what it is and what your, your studies are showing in that connection there. And I will be, I will be very self-disclosing here in that at the Lord Institute for Brain Research with Dr. Kalsa, who I work with, working on a cool, he just got his R01 study approved. And so we're starting in on that, that, that basically sort of specialized in insula. So the, the insula, I-N-S-U-L-A, is a, a part of, I'm going to be simple, a, a mid part of the brain that is sort of a connection between the primitive brain that just makes us breathe, sleep, eat, do what we need to do to survive, and then the cortex, which is the part of the brain that makes us sort of think, plan, be human, you know, travel to Mars, et cetera. And so this insula, it's the area where there is processing that happens there from both. So we have gustatory stuff that's there. So smell. And so it ends up being taste and food related stuff. that's there. There is stomach, breath, hunger, heart rate stuff, like how we experience and feel our body the idea of anybody that does body work and people with eating disorders about how the way, you know, we live in our body, the, you know, you know, our gut and microbiome and cortex, the connection between the body and the brain sort of happens through the insula. So I, I think we study the insula because I always say it's the first stop between our bodies and between the thinking, planning, anxious cortex of our brains. And so I think what we're trying to do is trying to pinpoint that so that we can take pathways in two directions, pathways about up to the rest of the brain about how we think about things and then pathways back to the body. I think the more I do research, the more I do brain research, the more that I think we realize of how much of our central nervous system lives in our body that lives in our gut. And that those signals are, are as important as, you know, as cortex signals that happen. And so, you know, we're, we're studying that right now. Our, our current study that we're working on has become that we know that people who develop eating disorders seem to have inherent poor connections between their gut and their insula, more so than people that just get OCD or depression, et cetera. There seems to be something about that connection that puts them at higher risk to develop eating disorders, definitely anorexia and probably bulimia, binge eating disorder, et cetera. And so what we've always said is, well, how do we try to manipulate the gut to see how people with anorexia respond differently? So we're actually using a vibrating pill, a Bluetooth pill, that they, that we can set and that we can sort of change as it goes through the gut to be able to see either from a top down, how they think about it or bottom up, how their gut reacts to things to try to try to elicit how people with anorexia are really different, how their guts are different, how their brains are different, how they respond to things differently, hoping that then if we can take that further, we can start to see, you know, are there signals or things that place people at risk that you know, you can look at early in an eating disorder, or maybe even before eating disorders are developed to try to, you know, we know the sooner with all mental illness, including eating disorders that you do interventions, maybe the better chance you have of things working. So a long explanation, including research of why we center on the insula. There's lots of other important places, anterior cingulate cortex, frontal lobe, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, those kinds of things that are important. I think we center on the insula because it's that first connection. And the more that we can understand that, then we sort of trace it out both down and up to sort of try to get these circuits and try to see how they're different in people with anorexia, how they look in people that are recovered and, and see what we can do to manipulate them. Wow. That, that was great. It sounds like you guys have 
a lot of interesting things coming out at the Brain Institute there. So excited to see how all the results from that stuff. I do have a little take home question. If you could for to help the newer professionals that might be listening, whether it's therapy, dietitians, psychologists, psychiatrists, whatever, if you could help them think of, or know of something you would really like them to understand before getting into the field of eating disorders. And I know that's a loaded question, but what do you think that might be? You know, it's kind of like Dr. Mosman, when you bring yourself back to the days that you walked into the world of eating disorders, what do you wish that you knew then that you know now as a take home? I, you know, I think that mentorship is vital. I, I think that you have to have expert caring. And, and, and again, I think the hard thing is smart expert people don't always make the best mentors, right? I think there has to be a combination between somebody who knows their stuff, but somebody who is really invested in teaching, who knows how to simplify things, who is willing to stick in with you with that. This is such a hard field. I would say probably next to addictions in the world of psychiatry, psychology, that if you do not have a hive to process and do things, I just don't know how you'll make it. Right. And so the, the nice, we'll, we'll talk about the nice things about social media and screens and those kinds of things is there is the availability, even if you're not in direct distance with people to connect with people to do supervision. I mean, even at my stage, you know, 20 years in, I learned so much by being with people. I don't think you ever stop the learning process. There's always a different case. There's always something that comes across. We don't have enough data out there, right? As a scientist, I can't make double blind placebo controlled studies about where weight range is supposed to be, how, how much exercise, how soon there's so many good questions that we need to give research to do. And so other people are vital trying to just by yourself, I think is a death wish. Uh, you know what? You just summarized the podcast in that last phrase, the last whole paragraph that you mentioned. So it is really about connecting. We can't know everything. We do want to find a mentor, a supervisor, a leader, someone who we can not only learn from their smarts, but also connect with so that they're teachers for us and on the way that we learn. So I really, really appreciate that. I did not pay Dr. Mosman, by the way, to say that. <laughs> this is that just summarized the whole podcast. And and Abby and I, before you got on, we were talking about how selfishly we had different questions for you because this is our time to learn and to connect. Well, Dr. Mosman, we really appreciate your time today and all of the information you have shared with us. This was really, really helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. It's always an honor to hear you speak and to learn some few things from you. Thank you, Dr. Voss. For- I appreciate your support. Like there's not enough, there's not enough doctors that do this, and, and all of us are certainly necessary. I learned for my profession as well as my kids. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah, having kids is certainly I, I would never have recommend people to have kids for the for the pure state of doing it, but it uh, <laughs> it, it makes me very humble. And it it, it really helps with empathy with parents because sometimes that can be difficult for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethherrell.com slash professionals.